Hello everyone and welcome back to a new video in the modeling analysis and design of reinforced concrete high-rise building and we are continuing our efforts in our project today. The topics I will be doing today is I will be assuming a dirt load on the slabs, I will be applying the soil loads on the basement and I will be talking a little bit about wind loads as well as uh, doing an initial check on the model and seeing if it actually meshes because so far I have not done anything with regard to the mesh. So with that being said, sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Okay, so to start with, I want to talk quickly about the wind loads because this is one of the things I want to get off my heart. Now, I want to apply wind loads in this building and I will be doing this in the future as I am planning. But it's not going to be nice and dandy. You see, Autodesk robot has two possible methods of applying wind loads. I've explained them before in videos. I will be linking them on the top right. One of the methods is to apply the regular ASCE or Eurocode wind in which you define the site classes and building and site conditions and so on. And the problem with that is you start with a two dimensional building and extrude in the third dimension. This doesn't work for complex buildings like this. And that's the reason why I have not been using the wind and snow 2D to 3D because my structure is far away from being uniform. The second way that robots can apply wind loads is by generating them using a wind tunnel simulation. I had some comments in the comment section saying that the ASCE allows for wind tunnel application of wind loads, and I agree with that. I actually looked it up, and it turns out, yes, it does. There are even some, there is a section 6.6 .6 in the ASCE code, I think this is an older code that I have opened, but alas, it's the same idea. It allows for wind tunnel testing, so you could argue that Autodesk robot is somewhat accurate in those wind tunnel simulations, but I mean, look at those things. There are a lot of things you need to include, atmospheric boundary conditions, even I think in the, I think in the commentary, it even says that if you have like tunneling or other structures beside your structure, like if you have other structures around your structure, you should model them to keep them into account to see how the wake turbulence occurs around those structures. So it's not really that easy, and I can understand that they want you to make a physical wind tunnel rather than doing a simulation wind tunnel. And even if I want to show, say something else while I was digging this out because it was not easy to be honest, I actually digged out the um, documentation of this tool. You see, this tool has been validated in Autodesk Robot by using a wind tunnel simulation, and they said that they have done some validation, which is true, they have done, and they compared a model with a simulation, you can see it here, and they have performed a wind tunnel test on it and compared the test with the simulation. And they said then that the accuracy is high and everything is fine. I personally need to study a little bit more because so far I'm trying to find a way of providing you wind simulations and robot without going on a scientific frenzy. You see, I don't want just to say, hey, you go to loads, wind load simulation, and do this and do that, because ev everybody can say that, but I try to somehow provide you this framework that a structural engineer, a practicing structure engineer can understand. Not just do this, do that, and that's the results. Because we can all get shiny cool numbers, but if they make sense, that's the question. So the, the other problem and the other hiccup along the way while I was investigating this, and that's the reason why my video is a little bit delayed, to be honest. And you can see even that it does specifically tell you that the wind simulation module does not generate wind loads according to any code regulation at all. Now, I know what they want to say here. They want to say here that the wind simulation that is done in robot is purely scientific one, by the way, the professional is wrong here, but uh, that's besides the point. But the idea is that uh, like this wind simulation that they are doing is a pure physical drag, you know, drag, weight, uh, flow, Reynolds number stuff oriented simulation. Uh, codes are different than simulation because codes try to um, package those scientific issues into a feasible, practical thing and that's what I'm struggling at the moment to do, to be honest. And that's the reason why I am still trying to figure out a way. Now, I want to tell you right now that I have a 
fallback plan for this. And the fallback, fallback, and the fallback plan for this is to manually on an Excel sheet calculate the pressure on each height on an Excel sheet and then apply a horizontal load on the nodes based on the tributary side area that the node covers. This is like my last ditch effort that I will be doing if everything fails, but so far I'm struggling with that. So, so far I still do not have a, like, a practical way of doing it. I could just wing it and say loads, wind simulation, and then of course sell you uh, the product and tell you, hey, robot is amazing. And then of course I can show you those colorful uh, pictures and tell you, you see, Autodesk robot has done its homework and did some validation, and so we have full um, full trust in this, but that would be dishonest, because I have also to explain the nuances, and that, for example, the ASCE co code, so I would have to dig deeper into that. So that's about window. The rest now is going to be a practical issue, so enjoy. Okay, so of course we have a garage here, or an underground parking lot, so I would go to the ASCE, check out the, um, the table, and see if there's anything about car park or something. So let's take a look. Anything about car park? Um, it seems nothing about car parks here. Okay, there are garages here. Passenger vehicles, yes. Um, 1.92? Oh, that's, that's too low. It's even lower than our live load normal. Our live load normal is pretty well suited because we have applied the highest lobby thing. Um, I'm surprised that this is small. Maybe it means the, uh, I think this means the simple garage with one car, I guess. I'm checking still if we have anything else. Stack room. No, we don't have stack rooms. Manufacturing. No, we don't have heavy equipment. No. Uh, let's see. Cars, cars, cars. Uh, there is no cars. It seems that the highest loads, with exception to manufacturing, is 4.79 in the ASC code. So I will run with that because I think I have a feeling that this is correct. So I would have to remove and basically apply loads on the two bottom car parks of 4.79. So how do I do that? I have to be careful and select those things so that I'm able to select the panels in the... Yeah, there we go. I have selected that. And I will apply me a load. Okay, so I will go here, add me a load. I'm selecting the live load case here. I'm going to my loads and I'll apply me a 4.79. I'm not going to make any reduction of live load here because it does not make sense to me reduce because I expect the car park to be filled to the brim. So 4.79 in the global sense, in the negative, I'll add that. And double checking if everything is right, I'll apply that. Close and double check. Yeah, it got applied on the car park. Yep, makes sense. Okay, that is about the live load. For the dead load, I'm going to make me an assumption. Now, for those of you who are listening right now, the dead load is not just an assumption. The dead load is basically the summation. It's called actually superimposed dead load. And it's anything that is added to the structure besides its self-weight. Um, and it is of unmovable nature. For example, you could say uh, that fittings here, yeah, if you have central air conditioning, is considered dead load. If you have tiles above the above the slab, it's called so that dead load. If you have a screed, if you have anything that is of immovable um, nature, this is also called dead load. And I want to mention something very important here. You have internal walls, external walls, and you have, and there are two ways of dealing with it. So the first option is to apply the loads of the walls exactly where they are. Like you go to your structure and you apply the wall exactly where it is by multiplying the height by its load and so on. You can go to the load and select surface and select linear load two points. In that case, it asks you for the co coordinates of the two points as well as the load on those two points. So you can select the loads here. Not a moment. And you can select coordinates, and then you would have a linear load on a slab. This is impossible to be done in E-tabs. In E-tabs, you would have to apply a line of simple of zero stiffness and then apply a load, which is kind of a pain. But in robot, it's readily available. Now, this 
is option one. Option two is to calculate something called the equivalent partition load, EPL. And the equivalent partition load is basically to calculate all the walls in the entire structure to sum it up and then divide it by the area of the floor. And in the equivalent partition load, you would have to either, now there are two options, equivalent partition load, the accurate option is to take only the inside walls because the idea is that we don't know where the inside walls are and leave the outside walls or take all the walls. So you can choose and pick whatever you want. I would be using one dead load that represents both the tiles and the equivalent partition load and everything else that I have. And for that, I will be selecting a load of three kilonewtons per meter. This is just a load that I came up with that should also include any fittings that I have below hanging. Of course, it is your responsibility to check exactly what the dead loads are and to calculate them. I will be assuming three kilonewtons dead load. Now to apply those dead loads, I, re I remember we had a big issue in applying the live loads, right? The selection was a nightmare. Now I have a cool trick to apply dead loads in a simple and effective manner. So if you go to dead load, and you can see there are no dead loads with the exception to the self width, which is totally fine. And you go to your loads load table. Because look, we have suffered in the last videos by applying those live loads on those planes. Now, if you are new to this channel, please notice that this is part of an ongoing video series I will be linking on the top right. If you think that you can simply go here and just select all the plates, it doesn't work because then you would be applying the dead load on the shear walls, something that we have struggled with in the previous video. So a good alternative is to go to load load tables and do a little trick. You see, I'm going to apply dead loads without using the GUI. I'm going to copy me this and paste me here a new line. Of course, this is one line. I could copy all the live loads. So control Z, control C. I just need to remember where I am. Um, 60, okay, this is the last one. So I go here, control V. Now I have a copy of the live load. I will first of all go to each individual one and switch them to dead load. So I'm switching, as you can see, the case from live load to dead load. That's a really cool trick that can save a ton of time, especially if the application of the load in one of the cases, the selection of those elements was a nightmare. So now it seems I am doing some progress. If you want to see the progress, go out to, uh, I mean, let me just save this and close. And also close this. Yeah. Go out to the structure and take a look now. Now the dead load has loads and the live load has loads, but there is still one problem. You see, the value of the dead load is the same as the value of the live load. Because when we copied the loads, we copied both the application and the value. When you copy a load, you copy everything. You copy the case, the application, lists, and the value. Now we switched the case, but we have not switched the value. So an easy task here is to say negative three in all of them. So negative three here and so on, negative three, negative three. And with that, I would have finished applying the dead load, something that should cost me hours of work is actually just a keyboard punch, it's just a keyboard hit away to be done. And this is the cool way of knowing exactly how robot works. This is this is the edge. Like, you know, I hope that CEE viewers do get a competitive edge. Yeah, you can see threes when it comes to civil engineering and autodesk robot. So I have my dead load. Now I intentionally not yet have touched this because this is a bridge structure. Uh, bridging to structures, so it might need special consideration. I have not touched this yet. I'm intending to touch this later. But what I need to touch now is the underground. You have loads here, so I will go and select me underground loads. So I go to geometry or to loads and special loads. There is something called soil pressure. Now, by the way, you should first of all go to parameters here and define your soil. Uh, for example, you could define here. Now, I will just use a clay sand and it's at rest because the structure is neither going towards nor away from the soil. The structure is not pushing against the soil nor it's being pushed by the soil. The structure is stationary. 
because the soil is being applied on all sides. This is different in a retaining wall. In the retaining wall, this would be active. And I have done two videos on retaining walls. I will be linking on the top right. A lot of linking today. Now, I will keep just to put this value here. I did not touch this before. I have detailed this before. So I will keep this with a clay fine sand from the zero. I use that, I go to results, click apply. And now I have my load ready. I need to apply my load. So I will click the local axis just to see how the local axis was defined. And it seems it was not clean because some of the z-axis are going out, some of the z-axis is going in. So you, I, will, I will suffer a little bit. I will explain why I will suffer in a moment. So before I tell you why I will suffer, I will try to do a blind application of the load. Now this is earth pressure. Depending on the code, you might have to deal with it as a separate case, or you could deal with it as a dead load case. It depends on your code. For me now, I will call it dead load, but I will call it earth pressure, just in case that I would need to separate it. Or maybe you are, dear viewer, having a different code where the factors of earth pressure are different than the factors of dead load. Applying earth pressure, I'm going to select everything here, and then deselect the shear walls. You know, the typical nightmare that I have to do. Of course, so far I have not performed any analysis on the structure, and I'm really afraid. I'm really afraid, and I think, I hope I will not be bombarded with a host of errors. Now, as far as I know, I tried my best to be accurate in my modeling, and tried not to blunder anything in terms of modeling, but the moment of truth. Is going to happen very soon in this video and if the model models itself correctly I will call it a day because I would have yet again finished another big step of applying the loads um, please why I'm doing this I have heard that it seems that my voice has a little bit more bass and is no longer crisp I try to change the editor tried to change a little bit in the sound settings so tell me in the comments if you think that the sound is better now. Okay, I think I selected everything. Yeah, I think I select everything. Um, should, I, should I make them a group? I think I should make them a group just in case. So I just go here and make a group out of the selection just in case I need them later. Okay, now, uh, moment of truth. If I apply this right now, I will not get satisfying results. You see, you will get sometimes satisfying results, sometimes, sometimes no. Now you can see a triangular load distribution typical to what a soil load is. The calculation is being explained in the retaining wall uh, video. And of course, the soil pressure is from the outside to the inside, but it seems something is strange. In some regions, the soil pressure is from the inside to the outside. In some regions, the soil pressure is from the outside into the inside. Now, why is that? The reason why this is, is if you go to the local axis, you can see that I am asking it to be opposite of the local surface system, meaning the load is being applied on the opposite of the z-axis system in the local di direction. Now, some plates like this one have the z going into the plate, so an opposite to z would be going out, and that's the reason why I have a problem here. You can see this plate, for example, this one here, has a Z going into the building. So if I say opposite to the local surface system, my force is going out of the building, although this doesn't make sense. So I need to improve. How do I improve? Well, it's very simple. I go to um, geometry, I go to additional attributes, or properties, sorry, and I go to local panel direction. Now I could change the X and Y and Z direction, but I only want to flip the Z axis sense for this. And I hit the apply button, there we go. So now this is correct. I click here, it flips and load flips, and I keep looking. And whenever I see something that doesn't add up, I just click and flip the axis sense, which flips the load, something that is amazing in robot.
I'm still salty about the issue of wind load, but anything else is amazing. Oh, this entire site seems to be off, so I have to click on everyone. That's cool. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is the moment of truth. Will this thing run? And by run analysis, I mean, are there any inconsistent meshes or stability issues? Because other things I can live with. So let's run the calculation and take a look and see what happens. I have no idea if it's going to work or not. And I am as anxious as you. And I do this intentionally because I like to be honest in my videos. I try to name things as the, I try to deal with problems as they emerge. Okay, I see mesh regeneration. I can understand this from my Strado design, uh, Strado um, programming, because sometimes you mesh the first mesh and then you see that it's inconsistent, so it deals with it. This is a good sign, actually. That's a good sign. I think, I think we are out of the woods. I think. Okay, now the, day, the time of truth, if it's going to be the moment of truth. Okay, I see isolated. Okay, I see a bunch of warnings, but not errors. Um, let's take a look. Separate structure. Okay. Isolated node. Okay, that's not a problem. Okay, let's take a look. Cohesion of the calculation model has been provided by the kinematic constraints. Okay. Thank you for telling me. Element defined in different stories. That's okay because we mixed and matched our story assumptions when we were modeling. That's something we know. Elements are not assigned of any story. That's okay. Fine. Separate structure. Yes, because you have modeled everything. Isolated nodes. That's also an error I can live with. But there are no instabilities. It seems we are out of the woods. Like this, for me. This moment, when I have a running model with loads on, is one of the pivotal moments in my modeling. Like, this is one of the happiest moments I have. So I remove the sections, and I th maybe I was happy too soon, maybe not. I can see conglomerations of red points here. Those are nodes. Those are the issues that needed uh, mesh regeneration. So there are two options here. Option one. I have overlapping slabs, and option two, I have curvature. If it's curvature, I can live with. If it's overlapping slabs, then I'm unhappy. So let's take a look. Okay, and now this I can deal with, I can understand, because you have a connection between horizontal and vertical, and this is I mean, this, this thing it seems to be multi-piece, so it's pretty hard to mesh it. I can understand this. But what about this conglomeration of nodes? Let's take a look. Okay. Ah, okay. I see why. Because when I modeled here, I tried to be efficient and I modeled an arc here for educational purposes. Now, between us, I would not have modeled an arc, but for educational purpose, I did. So now you have an arc and a slab and another slab. So, of course, the measure is going to suffer a little bit here and it tries to mesh consistently. Okay, fine, I understand. It seems, okay, of course, this is repetition, no problem. Those edges, it's okay, I guess. This is just because, as I explained, there is a connection between a curve and the slab, so this tends to happen. And what's here? Okay, this is also the same thing. I have multiple slabs. See, that's the reason, if you remember when I was drawing, I was trying to draw big slabs, big swaths of slabs, so that the measure has an easier task. I was aware of that in the beginning. Oh, and by the way, this inclined plane, I was having my issues thinking it might work or not, and it meshed it perfectly. And also here we meshed it correctly when we did do, do two triangles. So I should pat myself on the back here. Everything seems to check out. Now, it looks nice and dandy, but trust me, you are not out of the woods yet. You want, because I don't want you to think everything is amazing, because usually, I mean, usually you see other design courses start showing you those cool maps and showing you colors, and then, of course, making a, uh, making some sort of, I don't know, 
some sort of uh, clickbaity thing or clickbaity title and telling you modeling of buildings or something. Now, I might do the same thing, clickbait, but uh, in all honesty, I will not. Because I don't want to end this video on this bite note. I want to end this video with a warning. You see, I can do this. And it looks amazing with all the meshes and structures and forces. Uh, it seems amazing. But I am not yet there. I am not yet there because if you open deflections, you will immediately detect the problem. Let me go to the live load, for example, and open the deflection shape. And suddenly, it doesn't look so nice at all. It seems I have a deflection of 20 millimeters in the live load, and I have a deflection of 50 millimeters in the dead load. This means that my structure is not stiff. Also, and this is another thing that everybody has a mistake with, my structure is twisting. And my structure is twisting and nobody, I have seen a lot of, I have seen a lot of models and nobody talks about this. Now this twisting, as horrible as it looks, is actually not that horrible. I'll explain why the structure might twist. This is something that I had a, I had a research to do about to understand why this happens. But just to tell you that if you think you are done and you're happy, you should not. There is a lot of other things that I want to explain. And I think from now on, in the next videos, this is where the real benefit of this modeling series is going to be. Because this is the land where nobody tries to venture. Everybody gives you a perfect model. Everybody gives you a double symmetric model. Analyzes, everything checks out and starts producing models. Nobody gives you a real life model and shows you those ugly realities and tells you how to deal with them. And this is going to be part of my next video. How to, how to understand why this twist happened, how to, if it's dangerous, and how to mitigate that. Spoiler, the twist happened because of unsymmetric vertical load carrying members. And we need to deal with it next time, as well as deflection. So we are not out of the woods yet. Although our structure looks amazing, we still are missing some crucial, crucial text, tests. So yeah, that's everything I wanted to talk about today. It's only going to get more interesting because we now we have a structure that we have ready to do our experimentation with. And with that being said, that's everything I wanted to talk about today. And before I finish, I want to give a huge twisting structure like shout out to our dear channel members in the contributor level and the helper level whose names are going to be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as their support to the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with the videos on time hopefully and with a certain quality I try to achieve and for that I am forever thankful. Of course, I hope that you enjoyed the video and you found it beneficial. If you have enjoyed the video then please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting and so on. Especially subscribing because it helps increase the reach of my channel. With that being said and as per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.